Okay, I'm going to talk about deploying a bare metal Kubernetes cluster. Um, originally, I was going to say is easier than you think because I was feeling very smug about how easy this was. But then I sat in on Carl's um, Carl's talk from 12 to 1:30. Who was in Carl's talk? From, yeah. Okay. So this is way harder than his stuff. So if you can just do his thing, that's great. Just do that. I'll just talk about how painful it is if you don't know about call stuff, basically. Um, okay, and that's my, that's my little slide that I put in 15 minutes ago. Let me just zoom in. You guys can read it in the back, yeah? I don't know what's going on. Okay, okay so anyway, the, the, the takeaway was um, go and look at rancho.com, um, and that'll make stuff a lot easier. I, I think this still has value. Because um, there is, you, you can still end up in a situation where you can't use some of the out-of-the-box tools that Rancher has, and then you're going to have to wade into the pain that I am in. But I've got a few, you know, tricks which will help you out. Okay, what we will cover in, in 40 minutes, well now in 30 minutes, um, where I'm from, why I did this, what I did, how I did this, benefits and costs, and the demo. I've actually brought a little cluster. It's only got four cores and 16 gigs. It's sitting over there. Um, uh, oh, let me see if I can... Uh, that's the cluster over there. So we can maybe explore it if we've got a bit of time. If you want to go digging, um, this is the GitHub repo that has a set of bash scripts that will bootstrap a cluster for you without, without much effort at all. You just kind of enter some config values and then you hit go and then you come back three hours late and you've got a cluster. Um, the, the, the cluster that I've brought here is actually on a Wi-Fi network called Cube Demo. There's no password. And you can SSH in um, to the master if you want and poke around. I, you know, go for it. I'll, you know, I'll tear it down once the conference is over. You can even try break it if you want. The sudo user is CentOS master and the p password is Kubernetes. Um, you can go to the admin URL, which is um, at 98999, and you can, you, know, you can poke around if you want. Okay, where I'm from. I'm, from, I'm a data scientist, firstly. I'm not a sysadmin and I'm not a Kubernetes administrator. So I, I, I've gotten this working, but I'm totally open to anyone pointing out that I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, my day-to-day -to -day to tools are R, Python, Airflow, Bash, Docker. Um, mostly I build systems to get my work done. So I, I very much take the approach of just getting it done, getting it stable, and then actually doing data science. Um, my environment, my unspecified large organization, has a full Microsoft stack. But data science works better with Linux. Um, you know, large organization procurement is often a nightmare. Um, so we've had to build everything from scratch. We basically just get the bare metal servers and we can do what we want with them. Um, and my rule of thumb is, yeah, do as little as possible. So, so when I started, uh, we didn't have any servers. And this was our original stack. In, in you know, 60 seconds, we had one, one, uh, one big 50 core server, which had KVM, Red Hat KVM on it. On top of that, we put on three VMs running Atomic Host, which is a CentOS variant, which is now deprecated because they've moved to CoreOS, because Red Hat bought CoreOS. On top of that, we had a whole lot of Docker daemons, um, and, then, and then we get into the kind of like the application layer. For sysadmin, we use Cockpit, which is really awesome, and that was that little UE we had. Um, Nginx, open LDAP for integrating with Active Directory. That's how we can interface, well, theoretically how we interface with the rest of the organization. Uh, for storage, we use Minio. Show of hands, anyone heard of Minio? So, so Minio is basically like a, an AWS S3 clone. It's object storage that has AWS S3 compatibility, but it's, it's completely offline. So you basically can bring object storage into an environment that doesn't have it. And when you finally move to the cloud, you can just switch all your URLs and the APIs will work beautifully. Um, and then we obviously store all of our code in, code in GitLab. For scheduling, we use Airflow, which is what uh, Gordon talked about. I don't know if you listened to his talk at 10. Um, and then for actual data science, we're doing Python R, open CPU for um, surfacing APIs for R, and you know, Flask or whatever we want for Python or WebUEs, or uh, obviously Nginx. Okay, why I did this. I'm just going to pause here for you to all read this. Kubernetes is hard. It sounds easy, but you end up in very bad situations. Okay, I didn't want to do this. Um, Atomic Host and Docker and Nginx re rewrites worked really nicely, um, but we were getting no noisy neighbor effects. So I'd be running some big R job, and then an Airflow gorilla would kind of plow into my VM and break everything um, because of you know because it would take too many cores, or because there was too much I/O, or you know whatever. Um, Airflow jobs club resources. 
Um, we also wanted um, brutal death and spontaneous regeneration for workloads. So sometimes we'll, we'll uh, run an airflow job that might die, but it might take down like, you know, a VM, you know, or it might take down a container. Um, we'd, like, we'd, like that, we'd like to be able to tolerate that, but for, you know, whatever is with our scheduler to be able to like actually brutally just kill that thing. Um, and then, and then you know, bring up a new one without any ill effects to the system. Um, you know, the, the single VM um, implementation had a lot of single points of failure. And, and this is quite, quite important to us is that, you know, it's just a two-man team, right? And I think a lot of people who are in sort of bare metal situations, data science situations, are probably in the situation where there's like two of you or three of you. And you've got to do everything. And you realize that the only way that you can actually make, you know, kind of, have a positive effect on the organization is if you like export skill, right? So we wanted to be able to throw up Jupyter Lab environments that anyone in our whole 20,000 strong organization could log into and actually start coding in. Um, but you know, in the, original, in the original implementation, that meant like creating a container for each one of them and creating a username and password, and then you forget what that is and they break it and you have to create a new one. So we wanted to kind of solve all of that. Okay, so this is what I did. It looks very complex. You can't read any of it because the text is very small. But I, f I figured I'd leave it like that because you can always like download the slides and then like you know zoom in, right? But I'll just I'll just kind of walk you through it quickly. Um, okay, so so these are our VMs. We've got ten VMs and one little VM over there. Well, one big VM over there. That's not part of the cluster. Um, they've all got spinning Rust attached to them, which um, which runs Minio in distributed mode. Um, and what menu in distributed mode does is it does erasure coding over the whole thing. So I can lose up to five nodes, but I won't lose my data. Okay. Um, it also means that I can hit one of ten IP addresses for Minio, and it'll still serve serve back the data. So you know we don't have that kind of throttling of one IP anymore. Um, all of that runs on Docker with Kubernetes as the control plane. Um, um, for code, we keep it in GitLab, which is actually run off this little guy here. We don't want to take down GitLab if there's some catastrophic failure over here. The code is the, the most important thing. Um, and, and yes, um, and for, and for the, um, the rest of the stack, it's all pretty much the same as the first implementation. So it all looks exactly the same if you're an end user. Um, in terms, okay, so in, in terms of the gotchas, um, and this is, where, this is where I think the RAN should talk would maybe not be able to cope with like, like really bare metal situation is that firstly Kubernetes expects a load balancer. If it doesn't find a load balancer, it breaks. Um, it also, so, so you have to spin up something um, which gives you a load, like simulates a load balancer in a, in a sort of non-internet environment. And the thing that works really nicely is Metal LB, which is actually part of the Google Git, GitHub re, um, repo account. But that works quite nicely. And um, the other gotcha is that you, if, you, if you are in my situation, you probably can't create subdomains. You might be able to get IT to give you uh, one subdomain, you know, data science.ulo.com or whatever, but they're not going to let you, you know, arbitrarily add subdomains. And, you know, um, a lot of proxies expect that you can create lots of subdomains. So we use traffic in order to take that one, that one URL and to add subparts to all of our different resources. So someone can hit data science.ulo.com and they can, and they can um, you know, go to Jupyter Hub and they can go to Jupyter Hub or they can go to Minio and go to Minio, or, you know, that kind of thing. And we can dynamically create those on the fly. Okay, <coughs> how I did this. So the, the cluster I've got down there, actually, that's how I did it, right? I mean, there are some assumptions. You have to have actual VMs that are configured with static IPs, but that's it. Bay CentOS with static IPs and SSH access. Um, clone in my repo, go into the repo, change the variables to work with your environment, and then hit bash Kubernetes deploy. You have to enter a whole lot of like SSH passwords in the beginning, as it copies keys all over the place, but it just deploys it. Um, under the hood, these are the ingredients. CentOS, I mean, but you could use anything, but CentOS is stable, so we use CentOS. Um, KubeADM, which does all the heavy lifting of bootstrapping the cluster. Helm, which um, I don't really like, but um, you know, a lot of stuff comes in really easy, you know, you can put up a lot of stuff quite easily with Helm, so we use it. Metal LB, which I've talked about, traffic, which I've talked about. Jupyter Hub, um, which um, I think if you're in an educational setting, please look at Jupyter Hub, because it's just, it's so easy to spin up, and, you know, you can immediately give people access to code notebooks, and they can start learning, you know. Um, we have a lot of people who know Excel, you know, and that's it. 
And we really want them to just be able to like hello world in Python or R so they can start asking us questions. And that's a, that's a great way to just kind of go, you know, go, go sign in, you know, and it's fine. You can go sign in and you can mess around, do our tutorials, and then you can start asking us stuff. <coughs> um, Jupyter Hub, there is a bit of, you can actually make a nice little hack with Jupyter Hub where it can spawn up arbitrary other servers. So um, I, if any of you have used Jupyter Hub, you usually go into Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks. You can also go, um, go into R Studio. So I, I like R. So I'll log into Jupyter Hub and I'll click Spawn R Studio, and then it'll bring up an R Studio environment, um, which is really cool because you have that flexibility of you know the two services. Um, Nginx we use for static web services. Valero is a Kubernetes backup. Minio I've talked about, and then and this is the kind of controversial one I guess, probably the wrong choice on our part, um, is that everything I, like the whole thing is Bash. It's all Bash. Everything. Even the deploy YAML is actually in a bash script and it like cats it to a file and then does it, you know? Which is probably not a good idea, but I don't really feel like learning Ansible, so that's what I've done. <coughs> okay, gotchas. Metal LB I've mentioned. Oh, um, the other gotcha is that Kubernetes expects block storage to be present, right? So um, in that Rancher tutorial, for instance, you could go and you could click what, you know, what storage you want and you just click it and add it, right? But they have to be available. Um, if you're in a, a, you know, a bootstrapped environment, you have to actually create those provisioners manually. Um, there's very little documentation on this. It took us about a week. But um, yeah, the Helm chart for the NFS client provisioner works really nicely. You can dig into our code if you want to see how you do it. But what that means is that you know, automatically you've got like block storage. That you, well, not block storage, but you've got storage that you can add, you know, which is really nice. <coughs> and then corporate proxy pane. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the time you do have to get out to the internet to do stuff, but you have to get around to pro you know corporate proxies. Um, <coughs> there are three places you have to get into get around corporate proxies: inside the Docker daemon, inside the yum the yum um, or apt uh, config, and um, for your master like your master environmental variables because it needs like proxy access for pretty much everything. Once again, it's all in our code. And then I talked about this: no control over subdomains. It's, it's really tough because like, like the internet pattern now is, is dynamic subdomain creation, you know. You'd have like a subdomain per namespace or whatever. Um, we've, we've kind of used traffic to kind of, you know, kind of anti-pattern that into having subparts so that you can kind of throw everything up. Okay, benefits and costs. What's the time? Yo, I'm gunning it. Any questions? Um, on the on the bay on the bay metal. No, 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 we've just got two. Um, we're getting a third one in the next one to six months. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, another large unspecified organization. Um, but look, I mean, the way the reason we've built it this way um, is that, and I, I've tested it now, which is nice, is that we've got these ten VMs. They've each got about twelve cores. Um, the idea is that as we bring up as we bring up new um, new bare metal servers, we just move the, the VMs across and then, we, and then we expand them, right? On the libvert level. Uh, so because we've got 10 VMs, I don't really have to do any changes other than exporting VMs um, until I get to 10, you know, 10 nice big Xeons, you know? Um, yeah. Okay, um, so benefits. Completely free and open source. This is really nice because it's free, but also because if you're in a large unspecified organization, then uh, procurement is very difficult. Um, but if it's free and open source, you can just build it, you know, and you know, a month later you're up and running. Um, a two-person team can realistically serve content with this config. Um, you have to edit just one config file, which is in the repo, and deploy. Everything is in YAML, which is nice for looking back at stuff a month later and going, what the hell did I do with this thing, you know, yeah. Scaling is easy. Object storage is distributed, which is big, right? Because, yeah, you don't want to lose the data or the code. <coughs> okay, costs. Um, look, I've tried to be, we've tried to kind of automate everything, you know, and we've tried to make every, the reason we put everything into scripts is because we want to be able to have an exact replica of what we've got at any time so that we can, you know, have, you know, failover clusters or test and upgrade and then, you know, know it'll work on the original and that kind of stuff. But, um, with our old with our old system, which was one VM and a whole lot, well four VMs and a whole lot of Docker images, 
it was probably about 1% of our time was this admin. Now it's like 10%. Um, but the trade-off is that now there aren't just two people who can use it. There are like potentially hundreds of people who can use it, and it's no biggie. Um, it's hard to track down points of failure. So yeah, I, I have a little uh, like anecdote here, which I think is instruc instructional, right? So you remember I told you that I tested moving the nodes across. So I, I, I moved I moved five nodes from from the one KVM server to the other KVM server, and everything came up perfectly. Um, so you know the, the VM survived, and the you know the nodes the, the node identity survived, but DNS was acting really weird, and traffic was completely broken. And it took me about a day to figure out that traffic had broken the cube DNS, which is a much more fundamental problem. Because when, when those VMs came up on another node, um, the, the, the traffic um, DNS controller, which had been on, on one node, um, when I, brought up, when I brought up those other ones, I didn't bring them up all simultaneously. You bring them up in sequence. And, and the first one that came up got allocated this, this DNS controller. But that DNS controller, the, um, sorry, the proxy controller, the traffic proxy controller, um, it didn't have a, a Docker image. So it pulled it, you know, which is fine. That's what you want. This is the nice thing about Kubernetes. It's not there. Automatically goes, pulls it in, no problem. But traffic had upgraded from 1.7.16 to 2 the day before. And so I pulled in a, a, a traffic image that had breaking change or changes in their, in, their config, in their config files. And so I broke all of the configs of all of the traffic, and then DNS went haywire, and then I fixed traffic, but DNS was broken. So, okay, that's it, that's the rant. But you can see how like, you know, it's a really simple thing. It's just like a tag in one container, but it can completely screw up your whole cluster. Um, anyway, long story short, Please, like, you got to tag your images, <laughs> otherwise you'll have pain. And then uh, Kubernetes move, moves fast as well. Um, another anecdote, much shorter. Um, this isn't on our production node, but this little guy here, when I brought it up, it, um, it, it didn't deploy uh, kubeadm 1.14, it deployed kubeadm 1.16, because two months has passed, and that's how fast Kubernetes moves. But 1.16 has deprecated a whole lot of API calls that were in my YAML. Um, so, so, yeah, it, it broke everything and I had to kind of change three or four places and then it was up. But, you know, these things are, it's not, it's not easy, you know. You gotta, you gotta keep an eye on this stuff. So, rules to live by. Save six cores and 24 gigs of RAM just so you can have like a little three node cluster that you can like test stuff on so that if, if stuff breaks, it breaks there, you fix it and then you, you know, incorporate it. Um, break it down continuously and, and, and redeploy to make sure that there aren't breaking changes being hoovered in from all these dependencies. Lock as many image tags as possible and then uh, read the Kubernetes release notes for deprecations of their API. Um, that's my little joke. I want to be here, but I had to get there first and now I can be there. Okay, demo. So has anyone um, logged in and broken the cluster? No? All right, cool. Asking for a friend. <laughs> Asking for a friend, yeah. Okay, so this is traffic. Um, it doesn't look like Rancher. Uh, not traffic, it's a cockpit. Has anyone used cockpit? Anyone know about it? No, you know about it? I, like, we really love it, right? Um, okay, so, so this is the cockpit interface for, for a, uh, a single machine. Um, you know, you can kind of poke around, see what's going on. Um, there you go. So, you know, sometimes storage will run out on a node because it's pulled like three 10 gig images or whatever. You can go see it here. You can attach block storage. Um, you can see what's happening with networking. We find this re really useful de for debugging. And then you obviously get a, get a, um, yeah. <coughs> In terms of dashboards. Um, so the dashboard is actually, um, it's for managing a cluster of VMs. Uh, I'm kind of working in kind of, a lin you know, fashions of yeah, getting more and more complex. Um, so it doesn't really do very much except tell, you know, kind of give you an idea of the health of your VMs, how much memory is being used, what the network I/O is, and the disk I/O. Um, and you can obviously click stuff and you know, go to that worker. Cluster is the is the Kubernetes interface. Um, <coughs> this is all kind of automatically configured when you 
you know, if you if you run the script in, in my repo. Um, but let me start at the overview. Um, you guys will recognize it looks quite similar to to the um, the calls one. What is it? Rancher. Yeah, Rancher. Um, I, I don't, we don't really use it to deploy or you know add nodes or anything uh, because we can't really add nodes before we've built the nodes. Um, you can you know kind of take an, you know look at the the workers, um, look at the containers. Nice thing is that you can filter by project. Project it's called projects, but it's actually namespaces. Um, so for instance, sandbox is our Jupyter is our Jupyter. Um, well, it's, it's the Jupyter environment that we kind of let anyone use, um, and you can you know kind of see what the containers are doing. Um, you can look at the topology. It's really cool to show like our like high up manager types that, and they go like, wow, awesome, you know. But you can also use it to kind of debug because you you know you'll see if that guy is dead or not getting assigned to a node or whatever, and you, know, you can see what's going on. Um, but yeah, this is very nice for making gifs for manager types. Then you can dig into the details. Um, these are the services. I don't know how much you guys know about Kubernetes, but you can delete pods and they regenerate. Let's see if I can delete a pod. I might break. I might break it now, but let's see. Um, oh, actually, let's do it in the topology. Let's find one that is like dispensable. Nope, we're not going to destroy the. Let's try. Let's destroy cube flannel. That sounds pretty scary. Did, did you even see it regenerate? Did it regenerate? Let's see. Here. Let's try cube proxy. No, I don't want to do cube proxy. Chasing this thing with a. Oh, there we go. See, came back. So you know you can delete. Um, you can delete uh, pods and they come back, which is really nice. You can't delete services. We've done this. It's broken stuff. It made us very sad. Don't delete your services. Redeploy them. And then finally, you can see the volumes. So um, you remember I mentioned uh, the NFS um, provisioner. Uh, you, really, you really want to um, create a, an NFS store which is big enough. Ours is like two terabytes or whatever. But you know, when, when for instance, um, you create a JupyterHub user, they get, they get provisioned with, with you know, um, a volume um, here, which is actually just an NFS folder that's masked as a you know, block storage. Um, this is really nice because you can kind of see who you know who's using what, and you can actually um, our our pr our actual NFS store is on the master, so we can you know CD into that directory and kind of see what's inside. You know, if someone's breaking something or whatever. Um, okay, so that's that. This is traffic. Um, this is just the dashboard, which um, we actually have public because you can't actually do anything except kind of see what services are up, um, and it actually provides an API. A Prometheus, I think it's API. No, it's not API. Oh. The, it also it also provides a Prometheus compatible API so that this can be consumed by like some sort of static site that you know gives you like a di directory listing of what's what's in the environment. And then finally, Jupyter Hub. <coughs> um, so this is just on. It's called dummy mode, which means that I can enter any user, um, and it'll create something, and then I can spawn. And this will fail. Yes, it has failed. The reason it has failed is because the API deprecation from 1.14 to 1.16 um, broke the Jupyter Hub to, uh, deployment, the Helm chart. And they haven't fixed the Helm chart yet. So I don't know. I did this this morning. I didn't want to fix it. Um, but what you would do there, what you would get there is you'd spawn into a Jupyter environment that you can use, which is really nice. And that's it. If you have any questions, now's a good time. We've got about five minutes left. Minio. Ooh, yeah. Um, so, sorry. Uh, Hello. I'm just curious about the cluster storage because I work in a Hadoop environment, which is also a form of cluster storage. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me see if I can actually bring it up for you.
can't remember the port. Right, well, I can't remember the port. Um, but, yeah, so what Menio does is it provides um, a, web, a web interface, so you can kind of log in with your, your key and your secret, which is an API, um, AWS compatible key and secret. Um, and then you can kind of traverse it as if it was um, folder storage. But that's not really what it's used for. What it's used for is, is to fake, yeah, an AWS, you know, um, buck, uh, buckets. So you, you can spin up Minio as a single Docker container and, and mount the data sort of subdirectory like down to the host, you know, so you can just have it kind of running in local mode. You can also embed it inside another container, which is really nice, to kind of have everything in one go if you're running like an embedded app or whatever. Um, or you can do what we've done, which is run it in distributed mode. <coughs> and what you do in distributed mode, you still run it as a Docker container on each host, but um, you, in your Docker run command, you, you, tell it, you tell it the URL endpoints of all of the other ones. So it, t it takes a little bit, like there was a, some really painful regex in writing a bash script that arbitrarily does this, but um, because you know, on 10 nodes, you've got like this sort of Docker run command that's like 100 or 200 characters long. But when it comes up, they all come up and they start looking for, um, for each other. And once you get past 50, the 50% 50 threshold, it, it brings up the cluster. Um, and yeah, it's worked really beautifully. It's probably been the most rock solid part of the whole thing, you know. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, you can, you can kill them at will and you know, it's pretty resilient. Also, if it completely dies, because we have, we have Minio, so each Minio guy actually, Minio container is mounted down to, um, to a spinning hard drive. Um, yeah, so we've got these like four terabyte drives. Um, and the nice thing about that is that if like there's total catastrophic failure and all of them die, we can still get to the data on the disks, you know, by like pulling the sands and kind of traversing them, right? Um, but while it's running, you get this nice distributed um, stuff and there's erasure coding and all sorts of nice stuff. Yeah. Any others? Cool. So, yep. So, uh, no so there are there are two data classes right so so there's so there's persistent storage that you want to use in order to either manage like a database or to you know to use as like a traditional hard drive you know we'd use nfs for that yeah. i mean we'd prefer to use like object storage but it's a bad use case for object storage you know you could use like s3 fuse or something but i think bad things would happen um but most of the time we try and keep the data as in for our data science in object storage it's cheap it's you know resilient um yeah it's fast you know and so that that's what we use it for so so a typical workflow would be that we'll fire up a container that runs a Python or R script that speaks to our unspecified large organizations databases, you know, you know uh, ETL stuff into, into you know, that container, does some transformation, and then puts it into a bucket and then dies. And then, the, and then the next container would spin up and read that in, do work, and then, you know. And because all, all of those containers are specified in, in the code in the Git repos and all the data is in the object storage, it's like a really nice resilient model for workflows. Cool, I think that's the time. I mean, if there's any more questions, I'll happy, happily answer them. Cool, thanks guys, much appreciated. Does anyone want to break the cluster? Anyone ever wanted to do RMRF <laughs> forward slash?